Here we have the Arctic Corsair, the very last deep sea side trawler ever to sail out of Britain. She fished all the Arctic fishing grounds from Russia in the northeast Norwegian coast, Spitsbergen, better known to some people as Svalbard, all the way around Iceland, Greenland and occasionally the Newfoundland banks. She had a, a very, very successful fishing career and finally finished in 1987. Uh, and uh, from 1999, after certain volunteers of, of, of our organisation of STAND, the Fishing Heritage Group, uh, she was brought up to, hopefully, the condition that she was while she was at sea and when you go around when you're taken round uh, we like to think that this is how she was during her working life this is the troll winch and uh, there are 1400 yards that's three quarters of a mile i should imagine of heavy heavy duty wire that the troll is towed on the troll itself is dragged along the seabed and it's invariably a quarter of a mile astern of the ship itself while it's towing along the bottom. The winch also, obviously, is used for heaving in the, the fish, the bobbins, the net, all the heavy work aboard the ship. Before the advent of this piece of equipment, which we lovingly call the fish washer, when the fish dropped in on the starboard side, it was all gutted and then thrown across to the port side until it had all been gutted and then you would go across with your salt water hoses washing the fish before it was sent down the fish row but when fishing was pretty good you didn't, you didn't get time to clear that fish and get it washed for quite a while and of course that didn't do the fish and the quality of the fish a lot of good at all but one skipper in this firm he thought there's a better way of doing this and he thought of what became the fish washer and he got the crew to make one out of wooden boards and what it was basically it's an open-ended boat shape you can use it from both ends and inside there are two jets of salt water swilling round so instead of throwing the fish across to wait to go down the fish room the fish then was gutted straight away and into the washer swirling round the actual wriggling of the fish because there was still wriggling then the, the swelling of the water and the movements of the ship you can say they practically washed themselves and throw themselves down the fish room. The fact remains they were washed clean and down the fish room within minutes of being gutted. And they could be packed away 10, 15 minutes or something like that. So it saved time, a lot of time, which is, was important in looking after a, a perishable commodity like fish. But it also saved energy and a cleanliness the, the, the blood and the, the slime hadn't got time to set on the fish because it was swilled straight away it was easier for the crew as well one of the very very good uh, inventions and it was uh, uh, patented and made into what you say now by the trawler company patented and used all over the world this is the crew's washroom, bathroom, and as you can see, by 1960, uh, things had improved greatly. And the very fact of having uh, not unlimited fresh water, but enough for to get a, get a shower now and again in, in proper conditions. Uh, previous to this design, this area was normally the site of the cod liver oil plant, where the cod livers were rendered down uh, at sea, uh, ready for to uh, to be taken ashore as cod liver oil. Uh, the fact of having running water 
was uh, a real innovation. Previous to that, all my previous years at sea, it had to be pumped by hand. As you can see now, uh, we're in what was then the modern age. Uh, and this was the, the boiler that the, that the water was uh, heated up in. Just one little thing, although this, this ship, as I say, was state of the art, one thing was, that is the outside of the ship. And in the severe uh, freezing conditions that, that wet in them, due to maybe the condensation in here, there would be a coating of ice inside. So he didn't spend so long getting the showing. This is the crow's mess deck. Uh, there was only the skipper and uh, four other officers used the officer's saloon. This is where the crew had all their meals. And during fishing operations, once you started fishing, fish obviously took a greater part of your diet. Uh, lunchtime, you would have the same as any other uh, ship shipboard meal, uh, soup, main course and afters. But the evening meal, you would have maybe uh, a cow pie, meat and tatty pie, stew, uh, anything else, but also fried fish again. And then, eight o'clock-ish at night when the cook was finishing, he would leave out uh, some corned beef, a big wedge of cheese, and all the cold fried fish that was left over from, from the evening meal, which you would use for, for sandwiches, which would take you up to seven o'clock breakfast the next morning. Uh, fish three times a day was the norm once you started fishing. And uh, basically, your cooks were good, basic, ordinary cooks. Plenty of food, nothing fancy, but adequate. Now here, this is the officer's saloon. There was a skipper, the mate, the bosun, chief and second engineers, and the wireless operator. They would eat in here, uh, but they'll get exactly the same food as the rest of the crew, and that includes fish three times a day. Uh, of course, it's got that little bit more comfort, which normally goes with promotion. This is the ship's galley, where all the food was cooked. Uh, and one of the main things, in a, especially in a trawler's galley, a cook would never ever more than half fill a kettle, a teapot, pan on the stove, which is common sense when the ship's rolling and jumping about. Uh, he would be called five o'clock in the morning, all ready for, to have the breakfast on the table for seven. Three meals a day, by the way, and always two sittings, because he would always have some crew working. Uh, this, this was an essential part, the fish pan. Uh, personally speaking, I could always eat four or five pieces of fish a day, uh, a meal rather, uh, and then when you get a crew of 20, you need quite a large pan for that. But this is a, a, a very large galley compared to previous designs, hence the handhold here in the middle. Uh, the uh, All these tools, by the way, uh, and everything you see on the ship for that matter, has been donated by companies, firms, what have you, everything is being donated. So, uh, with a lot of, uh, uh, of help in that respect, uh, to make the ship and the galley as it is now, as it was then. Right, here we are in the engine room. The powerhouse, very powerful, 1800 horsepower diesel engine. Uh, the only thing I can mainly tell you about uh, the engine room is the same as any other ship. Everything is colour coded. And if you'll see pipes or pumps painted pale blue, 
fresh water. If they're painted green, sea water, salt water. And any pipes, uh, tanks, etc. that are painted brown is some kind of oil, whether it's fuel oil or lubricating oil. And of course, red is your fire hoses. Uh, very, very noisy. Uh, and once the ship set sail, that engine never stopped for 24 hours a day until you got back in the dock. And uh, they were so much more noisier than steam driven ships. And consequently, some of the engineers in later years had uh, problems with the hearing because uh, then, uh, even in 1960, there was no such thing as, as, as ear pads, ear muffs. Uh, this department wasn't mine, but uh, you can see she's such a powerhouse. Right, a powerful six cylinder engine. And just to give you an idea, here is a motor car's cylinder head. This is one of these cylinder heads. You can see where the 1800 horsepower comes in. In 1960, when I was mate of this ship, or second in command, if you will, this was my berth or my bedroom, for want of a better expression. <coughs> and uh, you'll notice maybe <coughs> some quite nice curtainings. Uh, when this ship was built, she did have those type. Previous to that, we used to have used uh, our towels or jerseys as a curtain kind of thing. But she did have a lot of this comparative luxury then. But when we took over the ship to to uh, uh, bring her as a, a, a floating museum, she had just have been well, ready for the scrapyard. She was in a shocking state. But luckily, uh, among other things, a few weeks before we opened the ship up, a gentleman came and said, can I have a look round? I said, certainly. And I took him round. He says, I am the man who did all the curtains and soft furnishings 30 odd years ago. And by then, uh, I don't know what company he was working for, but he approached the boss and all these curtains throughout the ship and the soft furnishings was done, given and done free. And that is a sample of what you see throughout the ship. Donations. Uh, you try to make it as much like home as you can. Consequently, the photographs of my family at the time. But uh, it may look a little bit luxurious compared to some of them, but it was functional. You needed the desk, you had a lot of writing to do, all that kind of thing. So, yes, although it was a bit more... Uh, comfortable, uh, you needed the space and the time. What I can point out here is uh, all of us had to, we needed three of everything uh, boots, jerseys, frocks, uh, mittens, uh, cotton gutting gloves, knives to gut the fish with, uh, and we had to buy our own bedding as well. Uh, and where do we buy it from? The company stores. <laughs> so they were the first people to, to pay back when we landed. Right, seeing as we spent over 300 days a year away from home, our family was very, very important family life. What little bit there was of it. And invariably, a fisherman's wife was both mother and father to our children. Like... My wife here. This photo, these photographs are what fifty. Oh, she was twelve and she was six then. Uh, she's sixty now and fifty-four. A long, long while ago. But things like this kept us uh, that little bit in touch with home and. Telephone, tele telegrams between between them, backwards and forwards. As time went on, uh, and uh, especially when 
VHF wireless came came into being, uh, the skipper and the mate at least, uh, we were lucky enough to be able to have telephone calls, even 2,000 miles away, uh, with home. So that made things that, that uh, what could you say, bearable. Uh, you're so far away from home, and uh, then again, you pick up a telephone like that, it was just a job. Right, now we're in the, in the captain's day room, sitting room, office, uh, whichever way you like to look at it. And you'll see, obviously, uh, the uh, decor and uh, furnishings are that much better. Well, that always goes with uh, promotion, doesn't it? But I must point out, yes, it is very nice, but it's functional. Apart from anything else, uh, this would be the place where he would meet uh, ship's agents, the customs, uh, immigration, the owners, or any other, uh, what you'd like to call, uh, dignities or Im important people that would or maybe could come aboard. But this was his office as well. It would also be where he would meet with his heads of departments, especially on uh, steaming off to the fishing grounds. Uh, he'd have the mate, uh, the chief engineer, and the bosun sat in here and have a discussion about where they're going uh, and what was required of them. Uh, Mr mate, uh, I'm going so and so, I want my troll like this, with describing. Uh, chief, uh, will be so and so steering, so many miles, so many days, uh, all, all that, whatever. Uh, it was required of the engine room and the bosun would also come in on these conversations as well because part of the time he would do in the mate's job because once you started fishing uh, you couldn't stay up 24 hours a day uh, we worked 18 hour shifts and part of that shift there'd be one officer or maybe even the, the skipper uh, having a sleep. So if the skipper was having a sleep, the mate would be doing his job. So while the mate was doing his job, the bosun was doing the mate's and then someone else had to do the bosun's job. So uh, they, uh, they had to work very, very close as far as the positions as well. This would also be where the skipper did quite a lot of his writing. And as you can see on the table, he'd his code books, uh, uh, his own personal uh, books and information that he's collected on the fishing grounds, the grounds he's going to work, uh, and also other uh, official business with the office. Uh, but as I say, this was quite comfortable and uh, with, with all due respect, you do expect to just get that bit better accommodation once you get into the uh, the boss's office if you will. Yes we're in the wireless room now and although we're, we're talking about uh, 1960 this was the Mimco, Marconi Mimco where we used to tune into all the different radio Luxembourg, American Forces Network and through this we could pipe the music or news whatever it was through throughout the ship and even on the deck so I just mentioned that as an added added bonus for us before I go on to the rest of the wireless room right the wireless room as such in today's world there are no such things as wireless rooms it's all done on computer but in 1960 when this ship was new to send and receive messages required quite uh, uh, an intricate, I suppose, procedure. And first of all, he had to tune in all these different red and blue uh, notches and to plug in what they call a crystal of whichever station you wanted. Okay, it's set up there. Then he has to tune in 
to a receiver on the frequency that he's got in and also another frequency for his receiver and in those days then you still had dot dash that was finished what five or six years ago I believe uh, with modern technology but in the earlier days uh, before we got a uh, VHF radio to send and receive messages it was on the single band system whereas you said your message and then over with every conversation you made it was time consuming and uh, quite aggravating at times when you come to think of, of today's modern technology but this was still modern technology in those days could I point out this clock each ship had a clock with a time you'll see the blue top and bottom three minutes after the hour and three minutes uh, after the half hour a silent period now 2182 was the frequency it was a calling up frequency but it was always also the distress frequency so for the first three minutes of each hour and the the first three minutes after each half hour was a silence period no one went on it unless it was for distress and those two times were indicated on your clock this ship did go on uh, and moved with modern technology as it was going along and we got the VHS and everything else that went with it right we're in the chart room this is where all the navigational problems etc are all sorted out we've got four drawers full of charts here bringing each one out as we needed it but apart from uh, navigation uh, a fisherman had to know the seabed more than anybody else that was his workplace that was where he earned his living on the seabed and he needed to know the contours of the seabed and what shapes they took uh, and it, it also helped him in navigation but that's where he wanted to fish and how it was done with us we used to use uh, a pen to draw lines round the various banks or gullies uh, and we used to use a depth of a hundred fathoms uh, and draw a line round that hundred fathom round the bank and inside the hundred fathom of course it would be 80s 90s 50s and outside the hundred it would be hundred plus obviously uh, but those lines made shapes and uh, different ones on the charts uh, took shapes like the top hat, the bull nose, the baby's foot, the kidney bank. Uh, but these were all pioneered mainly <laughs> in all our fishing grounds, Barents Sea, Bear Island, Spitsbergen, Iceland, they were all pioneered by Humber and mainly Hull fishermen. Uh, and even as early as the 1920s, when uh, they had no sounders, no electric sounders, uh, no wireless, uh, no electric log, uh, and uh, a lot of those grounds were pioneered by those men I could name one or two, one in particular, Walt Lewis, uh, uh, in the 1920s. You see that on the chart. Uh, and uh, we lived our life on the seabed. We're now in the wheelhouse. Uh, I suppose some people would call it the hub. But uh, this was the, the skipper's domain. And of course the, the mate or bosun whoever took took the watch. Once you were fishing, there was invariably only one man up here. That was the skipper, or when he was otherwise engaged either having a meal or uh, having a, a nap 
uh, the mate would be in charge. Hauling and shooting the ship, everything was done from here. And we're back to state of the art. Uh, what I would like to point out, because I know somebody will look, and they say, what's the bell doing inside? Ship's bell. <laughs> well, it's brass. And in this day and age, you can't leave brass outside. So we've had to hang it inside in the nearest position where it would have been. Normally this ship's bell would be hung just outside of that window. But here, uh, especially as time went on, you tried to get as much of your equipment as close to you as you could. Uh, radar, radar over there. Depth sounder, handy. VHF, a lot when we got it here. Your communication. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as time went on, it got closer and closer so you could reach it and see it all from this seat. But uh, it wasn't until oh, the 1950s, early 1950s, that there was a chair here. The skipper would stand for the full time he was stand in the wheelhouse. Some of them chaps, oh, the legs used to have problems with veins and things like that. But uh, uh, progress was a wee bit slow in the fishing industry. Uh, but it did get along a lot better. And when it comes to on deck, a lot of those inventions were done by uh, the men themselves. This is the electronic depth sounder. I'll start depth sounder because uh, originally when we started to get paper sounders all you got was a line which donated the seabed but as technology moved we started to see the smudges and wonder what it was and when the penny dropped we realised it was fish and of course the progress from there but a side trawler could not catch fish more than 12 foot off the seabed. That's the highest he could get the mouth of his trawl. So fish above 12 foot was no good to him. He wanted it right on the bottom. So, these are fish marks. Bags of fish, but it was no good, it was too far off. This one, yes, plenty of fish. And this, this was one of the best innovations we've had. The other one was uh, shackling up the radar with uh, a gyro compass. A gyro compass and the radar was the finest thing that we could use in fog. Brilliant, absolutely. Uh, and of course the master gyro is down below and the compass you see here is a repeater but we still had magnetic compasses as well just in case because as it speaks for itself uh, a gyro is uh, an electrical piece of equipment and electrics can go wrong very severe icing conditions I have seen ships like this and this one in particular all these bridge windows iced up solid except for the two clear views electric motor turning it round all the time it was also ha handy these for head to wind with a lot of spray coming in but that was the only way you could see out the bridge windows ice was a very very uh, one of the biggest problems and another thing uh, not ice as well, but on a radar. Fog, no big deal. Not being clever, but it was part of the job and you, let, you went along. But when you've got a lot of heavy snow, you'd lose your signal out because uh, a radar, like a, a sounder, sends out millions of signals a second through the air. It hits an object, comes back and gives you a picture of that object or an echo on your screen. But in heavy snow, 
you uh, you lose some of your your uh, signal, and then when it hits the ship, it could hit something you know iced up, so it loses a bit more, and when it's bounced back, it could lose more still, and then when the radar scanner that's sending the signal out becomes uh, covered in sloppy snow or even ice if it's it cold enough as well you could lose your picture altogether so therefore you were blind until you could clear that all conditions got better but that that was rather rare but it could happen uh, so really man's uh, electronic genius can still be beaten by the elements at times Right, before the advent of the cell log, or to put it in your words, a speedometer, we used to use a, a taffrail log. And what it was, this clock was screwed onto the very after end of the ship, and it would have a line from here to a fan, maybe 120 foot long, specially measured uh, as regards the length of the ship. And that would tell you how many miles you'd covered. It didn't tell you your speed, like the modern one. It just told you how many miles, what distance you'd covered. You see, that revolved round and round by force of the water, and the, the reading was on your clock. And as a matter of fact, that was the only piece of equipment that would be used by old Captain well, Skipper Walt Lewis I told you about all those years ago. It's just on display you know. What's important on any ship, but well, obviously a, a small trawler in particular, is whenever you're going down ladders, accommodation ladders, always face the ladder either going up or down and that means going down you go down backwards and hold on with both both hands and that is common sense health and safety right this is the ship's fish room uh, where all the money uh, is uh, and this particular ship could land or hold 3,500 10 stone barrels or kits which basically is around about 210 tonnes but to put it away comfortably and properly it has to be com compartmented if that's the right word so we wherever you see boards and slides like that you make your compartments up as you went along and these lugs here were where you put battens in so you could make a shelf. So your fish was put away with boards, then ice, and then fish on the ice, up to the next nine inches high shelf. And you've got boards, ice shelf, boards, all the way up to the the deckhead or the ceiling in your language uh, and in the after pounds you get round about 15 or 16 shelves all squared off uh, and you hadn't got no weight resting on them that was the the important part uh, and it allowed for the melting ice uh, or slime or anything to permeate through and run away through the bottom this ship, especially summertime, would take on board anywhere from 100 to maybe 120 tonnes of crushed ice that had been manufactured ashore. Uh, but by the time we come to actually use it, it had set quite hard at times, so it required chopping with an axe and smashing up small again. Uh, and to put a full trip away of, say, 210 tonne, 
this ship would need round about maybe 7,000 of these boards. Right here you see the swinger, one of the bobbers. He hooks the baskets up and uh, then as the empty ones come down, swap over. And uh, shall we say this ship did have 3,500 kits. That would need uh, over 3,500 hoists of fish. It would also mean maybe another two or 3,000 of boards, dirty fish room boards that wanted to, to go. And uh, all the dirty ice. So you can imagine in five hours they had the work cut out. Uh, they were damn good grafters uh, because time was essential. It was a very perishable commodity, so therefore it didn't want to be exposed on the market for too long. That's why they didn't start until actually putting the fish ashore until about getting on for two o'clock. And then again, off like the clappers to get away for seven. This is a model uh, of a troll. Incidentally, it was made at sea by a very good friend of mine, as it gives you a good idea of what the troll is like. It's like a huge stocking, getting smaller and smaller. And these, as you see maybe, are models of the, the bobbins that roll along the ocean floor. The troll in this type of ship was usually getting on for the length of the ship. Ship's 200, 200 Nine foot long, the troll will be about 180 or maybe more or less, depending on what the skipper wanted uh, in as much as which ground he was going to. So he could lengthen or shorten the length to his, his own particular uh, liking or wants. Right, this is just a, a few of the tools of the trade. One other thing is, this is what you made the next week, a braiding needle. And you mended them, you, you, you put your, your twine on these and made the masses as you went along. A nettle, we never used them for uh, many years after, what, well, late 50s, uh, when we got more, more better hauling and shooting equipment. But they were to pull back or to hang up your net while you were mending. A large crocodile spanner speaks for itself, teeth. So that one spanner could undo seven or eight different size chattels. Slip hook speaks for itself, small crocodiles. A, a fin, don't look at it, somebody's pinched that. Yes. A fin, it's used for splicing very large ropes and invariably they're made of a lignum vitae, very very uh, very hard. Uh, some wants to take the other one. Oh marlin spike. Same as that, but for splicing wire. And they they got bigger. And uh, one interesting item is this two foot stick. Uh, you used it to measure practically everything on the trawl, the warps, but with them being wood, they would either get lost, broken, or what have you. So you need to make a new one at sea. And uh, you needed a rigid, a rigid length. Easier, you can't mess about with. We tape measures, you know, even so, they're not perfect because they're sack. Everything had to be perfect. So, you had to make a new two-foot stick. What would you use as a measure? Hapney. Exactly one inch. And I have measured hundreds of fathoms of warp, measured trawl nets, everything with one of these. 
You see, a fisherman, he had to be quite adaptable and, you know, make and mend. Right, this is a, a painting done by one of our volunteers, he's quite a good marine artist, but it's an occasion I have a uh, good reason to remember. It was January 1955, about 80-odd miles north-east of the North Cape of Iceland, in atrocious weather, and I was a, a, a seaman, deckhand, in a ship, we must have been about 30, maybe 40 miles away, steaming towards that area. And the weather was absolutely shocking. I was on the wheel, steering the ship, and we could hear these two ships talking on the air, on the radio. And what had happened, uh, another ship had got into difficulties. And those two ships went out of the shelter of Isafjord and went out to try and help him. But unbeknown, he had uh, managed to uh, correct what was wrong, but they didn't know that by the time uh, the, the more or less got to know maybe, was they'd been head to wind for so long and they were iced up in such a condition and of course that affects the stability of your ship, the, 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 the weight of ice on your superstructure. And the weather was so bad that they dare turn round. Because once you got, you know, that'd be it. And the only thing they could do was just try and hold her up until the weather got that bit better. But it just didn't happen. And I was on the ship, on the wheel, listening to the wireless. We're going. We're going, we're going, two of them. And uh, that was it. I had a part with him the day before they sailed, Finn Andreessen. But that was, uh, that was quite a, that was quite a tragedy was that. Loretta, Lorella and Rodrigo, two ships. Went out to try and save a mate and finish up going lost with all hands themselves. Uh, I don't know if you could see, well you've seen, no, you've seen all the others haven't they, of, of ice. Uh, sorry. <laughs> this was another one, Arctic Viking. I had been mate of her on two occasions and uh, this particular time I was, I was at home Actually, I was, if I remember right, I was studying for my skipper's ticket. And uh, she was lost off Flamborough Head in the North Sea, coming home in very, very bad weather. And uh, she lost five men. She turned over. And though, as it happened, there was a crew of Polish small trawlers, dodging for weather, of course, but one of them saved the rest of them and took them in into, uh, I think it was Bridlington. Uh, and there were actually these Polish seamen, uh, they came into Hull and they were absolutely feated. Uh, our boss, Tom Boyd, he gave them a big party and a presentation for, for, for what they'd done. Uh, well, there's your, triple, your three ships, triple trawlers, you've, you've got all the business about them, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Good trip. The whole industry was like a roller coaster. Uh, good trip, bad trip. Lots of fish, no fish. Good weather, bad weather. Uh, no money, lots of money. Uh, not enough time at all. So much time at home if he was out of his ship. And it's all went, went with the fishing. And this one particular trip of man, uh, I had fished all the way around Iceland for 11 days. And uh, all I had was 1100 kit and one day left. I needed 2000. I thought, where we're gonna go? This is where a skipper's job really, it's more mental. 
and, and uh, I thought, right, there's only one place, Harry Carry Bank. And I went and I shot. And this was my first fall for one hour. 24 hours later, I was going home with 2300k. I caught more in one day than I had in 11. And that has happened many times for many others. You know, oh God, oh no. <laughs> you know, it was really a, a, a marvellous day. Oh, big con was that as well. Lovely. Right, here we are back ashore again. I hope you've enjoyed your tour and know just that bit more about Hull's great fishing heritage.